Oracle's having a rough week, a lot to talk about in this video. We basically have two exploits that have been caught being thrown in the wild by these two ransomware groups that have beef with each other. Oh, and also the exploit they've been throwing has been leaked in a Telegram channel and I have it right here for the video. You will notice there's some phraseology here that I didn't say. This is actually a, literally a folder that is copied from a Telegram channel. I'm gonna get rid of this to make sure YouTube doesn't get mad at me. I'll show it to you later. Okay, so to talk about this, we have to kind of set the stage here. Uh, there's a software call, called Oracle Oracle eBusiness Suite, which is kind of like your run-of-the-mill uh, software for a company doing company stuff, right? You got to have your human resources software, you got to have your payroll software, you got to have your supply chain management software. Oracle eBusiness Suite is a software that does that. Hashtag ad. Just kidding. I'm not paid by them. Uh, but so this has been the target of vulnerabilities for a variety of reasons. One reason being that a lot of companies have this kind of software. They need it to run business activities. And as a result, you know, from a pay off on your research type thing. If you find a bug in this, it's likely that a lot of companies will use it and you can attack them for ransom. So the two bugs here are bugs uh, 61882 and 61884, which are both vulnerabilities that are exploited in some component of the Oracle eBusiness suite. Uh, this one, a lower severity score at 7.5 targets the Oracle configurator, which likely is like the wizard to set up Oracle eBusiness e suite. It's probably why it got a lower score, but this one, kind of the, the mother mother of pearl uh, that just targets the concurrent processing product, probably a more readily available product, uh, got a 9.8 severity score. So what is happening here, right? The, the main thing is that there has been a widespread extortion campaign, extortion being ransomware, okay? If you don't know what ransomware is, ransomware is very simple. This is a square, okay? And this is your computer. Very, very simple stuff. You know, your square computer. And inside of your computer, you have these sensitive files like, you know, taxes.2025.csv, okay? And you need that file to do your taxes because otherwise the government will come to your house. Just kidding. You can't do that because they're shut down, but they would if they weren't. Now what, a threat actor like Klopp or uh, Scattered Slattice, or just, they keep changing their names, but these, these threat actor groups, they hack into your computer via some vulnerability like these CVEs are talking about, and they either steal your files and extort you for them saying, hey, I'm going to show your sensitive information online if you don't pay me, or they just take your file and they encrypt it, right? So they have some kind of pi private key that you don't have and they encrypt your file so it turns into a bunch of gobbledygook and they say, hey, you wanna do your taxes, right? Obviously, okay, so you gotta give me money and I'll give you the private key to uh, decrypt your data, right? That's kind of the general idea behind ransomware extortion campaigns. And so this threat actor Klopp has been caught doing a variety of things, exploiting a variety of software. And one of the exploits that got caught throwing was a CVE 61822 that takes advantage of Oracle EBS customers, the, the enhanced business suite or the e-business suite. Now, what's really interesting is that not only have we seen them throwing the zero day, they leaked the zero day uh, somehow on, I think a telegram channel. And you can tell that it's really them. It's really Santa because of uh, the, the phrasing of the folder that I downloaded. Now I would never name a folder this, um, but a couple of basement dweller ransomware actors may. And so if you look in this folder, uh, you have two Python scripts that are actually the exploit. So one is an exploit that gets thrown and another is a server that you use to catch one of the callbacks from the exploit. I'll go into these and explain how they work here in a second. I just realized, by the way, that the files still retained their, um, their timestamps. So this software goes back to May of this year, which is actually pretty nuts. And then suspiciously, the readme was written recently before the leak. So that almost makes me feel like it was kind of like a false flag thing. I do want to say, by the way, on false flags, the Klopp ransomware group is thought to be associated with Russia because what is it? Their 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 software like will not execute on Russian language systems, but. Also, that is something that someone would do if they want to look like a Russian threat actor. So again, the world of, of cyber attribution is super complicated. So like for me, this screams someone who wants to look like a Russian threat actor, but may not actually be Russia, or it could just be Russian. Maybe they suck, I don't know. But in any case, the vulnerability here uh, is pretty simple. So you kind of have these two scripts that get ran. The first is this exploit.py. And what it does is you are able to send the uh, Oracle eBusiness suite a request to this UI servlet uh, endpoint, right? And this is done without any authentication, by the way. What ends up happening is you send it this XML blob with this initialized contents. And inside the initialized contents, you have this thing called return URL. 
you, the attacker with no credentials, are able to control the return URL such that the server itself makes a request to this, this place and downloads some kind of payload. So here in the script, they are able to control the you know, internal host that they're, they're, they're trying to point to uh, and the payload associated with it. And that basically is what triggers a bug, right? So they reach out to the server, they download a payload, and that payload gets processed by the eBusiness suite. Now the question is, what is the payload? So to trigger the payload, right, you have to host a server that gets called out to. So again, that exploit gets thrown, that SSRF, that server-side request forgery happens, and a request is made to you, the attacker who controls this server. Now inside of this server, they serve this XML file, right? Kind of like a standard looking XML with a bunch of very interesting characteristics. One of them being uh, a base 64 buffer that contains a bunch of Java uh, arrays, right? And so th these Java arrays then get put into uh, the Java runtime, get runtime exec command, which basically is the same as, uh, as system in, in C. So this is literally taking XML and forming it in a way that gets processed by the server to enable them to run a variety of commands on the server. It literally gives them remote code execution. And so what you see here is the um, commands that are recommended to be ran, right? So if you know your target is Linux, you run this uh, bash i dev tcp 888444. This is a reverse shell, right? So let me kind of give you the, the diagram of how this exploit works. And yes, of course, today's video is sponsored by me, yours truly. Guys, I honestly believe that if you want to be a good programmer or a good cybersecurity analyst, you have to know how computers work at the fundamental level. And in my opinion, the best way to learn how the computers work is to learn a language like C or learn a language like assembly. Now on the level of Academy. I have courses that do just that. In Zero to Hero C Programmer, we go through and learn the entire C language. And at the end of the course, you make your own little employee database project. And we've recently added a feature where you can go and as you're making commits to your project on GitHub, it will automatically run tests for you and test to see if you've passed the project. And then eventually, if you complete all the modules in the course, you get this cool little certificate here that if I move my fat head, this QR code can be used to cryptographically verify that it is actually your certificate. And guys, if you put your email address right here on the site, you can get a free three-day C course sent right to you. You'll learn how to write your first couple lines of C to get your feet wet in the world of low-level programming. Anyway, thanks for watching, guys. Let's keep going overall. So you have the, the target server, and you have you, the attacker, right? So let's say that you're the attacker here, and you have the, uh, the target server here. And I love that it didn't align the text, okay? Uh, so first, you make your initial request, and this is just a generic post request, and this contains that XML blob that has the, the return URL contents, right? So this has the return URL inside of it. Now that return URL is going to then be processed by the target server, and the target server is gonna call back out to the contents of that return URL, which also, surprising, is an attacker, okay? And then that attacker is going to return the malicious XML blob that contains the Java to be serialized and eventually executed so that you run that code on the target server, right? And by doing this, you're able to arbitrarily run commands via the um, runtime exec commands function. And what this allows you to do is do a reverse shell, which is just literally the execution of bin bash over a TCP connection back to another location, which, oh, by the way, also is attacker controlled, right? So this is the overall attack chain with some very poor drawing here. I'll kind of make this look prettier for you guys. Uh, but yeah, that this is the thing that is happening for that one exploit. Again, just super interesting that this like entire payload got leaked to the internet and you can tell that it's leaked because of the name of the files and the IOC. Now, here's the issue. The IOCs for this, I think, are very incorrect. Okay, the reason why I feel this way is because these IOCs will tell you if you were attacked by the CLOP ransomware actor or the scattered lapsus dollar sign, whatever ransomware actor, right? Because of the, the IP addresses associated with those two actors. Now, at the time of this publishing, it is likely that those actors know they've been caught and they've rotated IPs into some other infrastructure. So these IOCs are likely not relevant anymore. And then also, the fact that you see this string running on your computer does not mean you've been compromised by this zero day, right? This is simply just 
I have been attacked by a reverse shell. I have a, 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 a malicious actor on my machine that is sending back a reverse shell to their, their infrastructure. Um, but like this has nothing to do with the actual CV we're talking about. And then also they publish like IOCs that are the hashes of the exploit. Like these scripts, exploit.py and server.py would never run on your infrastructure, right? They would run inside of the attacker's infrastructure to attack you, right? Like this would be like, some place that they have control that they want to get control into your server. And so you would never see this IOC populate. You would never see the SHA of exploit.py. So the question then is like, okay, what is a good IOC? I think a good IOC from like a network intrusion standpoint would be, am I getting a payload that has this initialized blob? Am I getting a payload that has param name return URL? Like to me, that does a better job of describing, hey, someone is giving data to your system that is meant to trigger the vulnerable code path, right? I don't think the other ones really do anything aside from potentially tripping a bunch of alarms on other bugs or like just doing nothing. Cause I, 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 like, why would you see this file on your computer unless they already have code control in your system, right? Kind of a weird thing. Like this isn't malware. I think the confusion is that like, oh, exploit.py and server.py are malware. Nope, they're not malware. They are the exploits and the server software used to trigger the vulnerability, which is which is not useful from a defending standpoint. <laughs> the reason I mentioned there was beef, by the way, is this is the readme file that came with the folder that I downloaded. Um, like, first of all, why'd you put this 10 times? If you read the first line of the folder, clop, which is like the other threat actor, you are now reported to the RFJ, don't know what that is, with your full docs, we have your location, you will be drone striked fuckhead, okay? So what I'm assuming is that like, these guys maybe collaborated in the past and then like clop took this exploit and like used it and maybe leaked it or something and now there's like beef between them. And then after this, they, you know, talk about how to actually use the bug. And then they repeat the clop you are now reported thing in the in the readme. I don't know. It's just weird. But anyway, I'm not gonna like source this this folder to people. You can go find this in Malware Bazaar. Like literally, if you just take the IOC that has been published, right? You take the SHA of that folder, you can go to Malware Bazaar and download it. If you want to go play with it, go play with it. Um, interesting bug for sure. You know, the issue is primarily that there is a endpoint that is exposed that should not be exposed, as well as a Java, I'm assuming deserialization issue uh, that allows you to arbitrarily run Java on the server. And by doing that, you get code control and can eventually shoot that reverse shell back to your attacker infrastructure, which is pretty cool. But uh, yeah, would Rust have fixed this? I don't think so because like, again, this doesn't seem like a serialization issue where like they're deserializing untrusted code. It looks like they're just taking an arbitrary base 64 object and like running the code inside of that yeah it looks like they literally just allow you to provide a java script not javascript a java space script uh and like so if if this were created in rust and like the 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 design was that it allowed me to arbitrarily upload a rust file this would be the same bugs like in theory no this is more of a um api design and like threat modeling issue than it is like a rust or like memory safety or bad languages issue. So anyway, guys, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it. If you like this video, do me a favor, give me a little kiss on the cheek, and then we'll see you in this video that I think is also just as cool as this one. Give it a click. I'm waiting. Goodbye.